one. Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to this month's Cooking Without Looking TV show, Quarantine Cuisine Edition. I'm Alan Preston. Yes, and I'm Annette Watkins. This is my little baby, Coco. I want to introduce you to her, and I want to welcome everybody here again to Cooking Without Looking. Alan, it's great to see you. Why, thank you, Annette, and it is great to see you too. Hey, just a reminder to those of you watching today that Cooking Without Looking is a television show which pe features people who are blind and visually impaired and some that don't talk so well sometimes too. <laughs> yes, and we like to say that we are changing the way that you see blindness. Today, we are featuring the Ohio Organization for Diverse Opportunities for the Visually Impaired. They educate general public and change and uh, and change misconceptions along with providing a support system that enables individuals who are low vision or blind to experience equality. That's fantastic, Alan. You know, and two of the members here today, Tracy May and Jane Butler, they're going to prepare some wonderful, delicious dishes for us. So I've heard and they really sound good, too. Well, and Food for Thought, Annette, will be speaking to Pastor Kevin Perrine. Uh, he's the executive director of the organization. Yes, I know. I'm so excited to be able to interview him. But now we're going to start with Tracy May. She is a member of the Diverse Opportunity for the Visually Impaired. Hi, Tracy. It's great to see you today. How are you? Great. How are you? Good, Tracy. I'm so glad you're here with us today. And I'm excited because you're going to be making your, I think, a roasted chicken, correct? Thank you. Yes, rosemary, lemon chicken. Excellent. We're going to hear more about your recipe, Tracy. But first, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Mainly, I just want to ask you, just tell us a little bit about yourself, Tracy. Okay, well, I am, I was born. Born in Roswell, New Mexico, moved back up to Ohio with my mom and dad, one about two, and I learned cooking from my mom. And uh, so uh, she's from Mexico, so I can really cook really good Mexican food just like her, I want to say anyway. <laughs> and I had uh, two amazing boys and two girls that are going to be my daughter in laws when they get married. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And I have four amazing grandchildren. I do a lot of church work and activities, and um, I like to do fundraising and cooking. I've, I've always liked cooking. I used to do catering and ran a businesses for restaurants when I was able to see. I became blind about five and a half years ago due to diabetes. And uh, so at first I thought that my life was over, but I didn't let my blindness put me down, I kept saying you can do this. And so I just I got back on the wagon and started cooking again and um, and uh, just keep on going and hope that I can influence other people to uh, know that just because you're blind does that mean that you can't do what you love to do. Oh, that's wonderful. I was reading your bio, Tracy, it's so impressive. I, if you don't mind, I wanna ask you a couple of follow-up questions to that. Um, okay. You said you were, yeah, you said you were only, you've been blind for only five and a half years. That's not really that long. And I was just curious on the diabetes aspect and how did diabetes progress? How long did it take to progress into blindness along with the lupus as well? Can you tell us a little bit more? I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was about 25 years ago. And, uh, and so for a while there, I didn't take care of myself because you always saw when you're in your 20s, that it's never going to happen to you. And then I have um, a blood lupus, and it didn't, we didn't know I had it. And between the blood clots affecting my eyes and diabetes, everything has accelerated itself. So once I found out that I was losing my vision, I was pretty much totally blind within 10 months. Wow. So, wow. Well, you have an awesome, awesome attitude. And being a manager of a restaurant, that is a fast piece. Business. Yes, it is. And I love it. And I love and catering. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear you. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I love to cook and I love catering and I love cooking. And 
it's my stress relief. Yes, I am excited to, to know more about that. I bet that rest, being in the restaurant business has helped you to really progress well in your cooking now, I'm sure, hasn't it? Yes, yes. So so I'm I myself kind of lucky that I've always been able to work in the kitchen and I can still pretty much do everything and everything, but of course now I have to do it more slow. Right. And measure. You know, and now I have to uh, measure things where before I could just eyeball it. Right. So now uh, going slow and measuring and uh, and doing it like that, which is, you know, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Exactly. You just had to modify and change things up a little, but I'm sure that the, I call it the DOVI or the, the, uh, the Division for the uh, Visually right. Impaired Organization. How has that helped you to help you along in your blindness? Well, um, like they helped me look, like how to learn to use my email on my phone and uh, they had different programs like uh, like they could, they uh, we are go bowling and we do uh, different things and we're doing a sensory garden here at the Botanical Gardens that Kevin got us hooked up with and uh, Yes, we're visually here and blind, and we're going to learn how to grow our own herbs. We have all kinds of things. We've done gingerbread house making. We've done all kinds of things. And so people just give Kevin suggestions, and he tries to uh, figure out what uh, we can get done. So it's been a great help knowing that. And it doesn't cost us anything out of our pocket. That's awesome. That's like a great support system. I mean, you could probably attest to this that how great, how important is it to have a support system? I mean, tell us how, how much that means to you. Right, you know, and I have met quite, quite a lot of amazing people through this group and through other uh, uh, groups that I, you know, that I belong to that are uh, all visually impaired. And it's just amazing that everybody gives every support when somebody's down and they're like, hey, you can do this. You know, don't let somebody else tell you that you can't do it. Stand up for yourself. You know, so it's just it's just amazing to have people that help you uh, boost your morale and uh, get you going to what you want to do. Right. That's. I wish they had an organization like that down here in South Florida because we need we need support no matter what. If you're a single mom, visually impaired, if you're blind, you yes. need that community around you. So. Absolutely. Well, let's Rock see. Your dog poop. Sorry? Say it again. I don't know who spoke, but <laughs> that's okay. You know what? We're going to get started with your wonderful recipe. So, what? Take it away. You're in the spotlight now. Show us this wonderful recipe you have. Okay. Well, it's called rosemary lemon chicken. You're going to take about four pounds of chicken thighs, skinless chicken thighs. And you're going to salt and pepper them, and then you're going to lightly dredge them in flour, and you're going to sear them in about one tablespoon of hot oil. And um, and I had already started doing the chicken, and I uh, got that out of there, and I put that on a platter, and now I'm sauteing six cloves of chopped garlic and three large medium onions. And you saute that for about four or five minutes and do not be afraid to set a timer. It's all about timing. You, you can smell a lot of the food getting done. You can hear it, but it's all about timing. So you have to factor in all three things, at least for me anyway, hearing it, smelling it and timing. So or before I could just look and say, okay, this is what you do. Well, now I have to set timers and that's okay to uh, do that. So, so here I'm, so I'm, I'm sauteing this, and now I am going to add uh, a half a cup of lemon juice. Are you using Are you using freshly squeezed or just the bottle, which is fine? Which kind of lemon juice are you using? I used uh, freshly squeezed lemons, so it takes about four lemons to make about a half a cup. Nice. And uh, further love. Straight back. Did that one? The little, oh, you want you skip right over it. Oh, to your right. Stop. Right. Hold on, I'm trying to find You're the. You're touching everywhere but where the little bowl is. To your left. Your left. Slow, slow, slow. It's it's blue bowl. Oh, then that's over two more feet further back. Sorry about that. I thought I had everything 
That's it. Okay, there I got go. it now. Now I'm gonna add a half a cup of lemon juice. You're gonna pour that in your pan and always wear a lid or a pot holder. And uh, for people that are not used to uh, cooking, so that way you don't get burned, especially if you have neuropathy, because it takes a while longer. And I believe in putting the hand in that in that um, hand that you do not use the most. So since I use since I am right-handed, I will hold a skillet with my left hand on the handle and stir and use my right hand. That way, you're not going to get all discombobulated and trying to what you're what you're doing. So then we're going to bring this to a boil. And this is a gas stove, so some people are afraid to use gas stoves, and you can use bump dots on your stove to show you where high, medium, and low is. That way it can help you out. So you don't have to be afraid to use a gas stove. And uh, try not to wear long sleeves, of course, and uh, try not to have your pot holders or your towels, you know, on the table, I mean, on the, uh, on the uh, stove, I mean. So we're bringing this to a boil. And now we're going to add uh, some uh, rosemary sprigs. We're going to add three rosemary sprigs to it. Yep. I have all these bags here that I brought from home, trying to get clean and ready to go for you. So we're going to put three rosemary sprigs into this pot or your or your pan. It could be a skillet. But this could be an oven dish or a skillet dish. And then you're going to stir it up. You're going to bring this to a boil, which will take about two minutes. You just stir it, you know, just stir it just a little bit, just get everything together. But once that comes to a boil, then we are going to add three fourths cup of chicken broth. If, if I don't have chicken broth, Tracy, could I just use water or that will just you not use, have... Yes, you can use three-fourths cup of water. And if you have chicken uh, bouillon, that's good too. Okay. That's good too. You can, I, I like the powder because it dissolves a little bit faster. And... Uh, Chug of broth is to your left. Behind. No. Keep going left. All right, so now we're going to add the chicken broth to it. Then, once we uh, get this uh, boiling, then we add the chicken broth, and then we're going to get that boiling again. And now take another two or three minutes. And then we will nestle the chicken back into the onions, the garlic, the lemon juice, and the chicken broth. So and if you're going to pour things, you know, use a bowl underneath your measuring cup because, you know, of course, being at the OC, it's very easy to over season. And so we want to make sure that we don't get too much of any of, of one item in there. And sometimes, you know, you're going to have to use your finger to kind of feel, and that's okay. So. Go further up. up. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Oh, to your right. Oh, no. There. Sorry. <laughs> All right. You're doing great, Tracy. You're doing great. We're loving it. Thank you so Sorry. much. A little nervous here. You know, I love the book when I keep coming. It's always harder when the camera's on, but just pretend it's not there. Yeah, that and plus I'm not used to this kitchen. <laughs> oh, that makes a big difference. All right, so here we have a uh, three-fourths cup chicken broth. So we're gonna bring that to a boil and as you're cooking, you can smell the rosemary. Mm. It smells such a great aroma and then with the uh, lemon juice. And uh, the recipe calls for uh, grated, uh, 
lemon zest. Um, I did not do that because I I like lemon, but you know, flavored food, but sometimes too lemony is it doesn't it does not agree with me. So I did not put that part in there. But but if you like it really lemony, you can do that. So now that this is boiling again, you're going to nestle, you're going to take all your chicken off the platter, which is only, you know, when you uh, sear it, you only sear it like four or five minutes on each side. And you don't want it fully cooked. You're just gonna simmer in the oven, I mean, in your skillet for about 30 minutes. And you can, you know, when you're, when, when you're browning the uh, chicken, you can smell, you can smell it browning. And like I said, you can set timers and do not be afraid to set timers. You but you said, you, you made a good point that you could smell it, that it's sizzling, that it's, it's being seared. That's a good point. Yes. And uh, if you try to move it off the skillet, before it's, you know, like brown, that, that it kind of sticks. So you want to make sure that it's easily able to be flipped over. So if it's sticking, you might want to let it cook for another minute or so, and that's okay. There's two more on the far end of the platter. There you go. So. All right, so now we're gonna stir this up a little bit to get kind of the lemon juice and onion mixture, chicken broth over the chicken. Now we're gonna reduce this down to like a similar to a medium heat. And we're gonna put a lid on it. You can put it in the oven if you would like and bake it at 350. But uh, with me having such a bad back, sometimes it's hard for me to bend over, get things out of the oven. So I have my skillet here and then I have a nice lid and I'm going to put that on there. And now we're going to let it simmer for about 30 minutes. And then when you take the lid off in 30 minutes, you can take your tongs or your fork. And once the tongs or the fork goes into your chicken very easily, then it's usually done. If you feel a little toughness to it, it's not quite done yet, and do it for another 10, 15 more minutes. So, that's about it. It sounds it sounds very easy, and it's it also. I wish we could had smell a vision so we could smell that rosemary. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, but um, I had the finished product. I didn't know when you wanted to look at that because I. I would love it. to look at that. Please show us the finished product, oh, Tracy. So, so once it got done, I put it into a casserole dish. Okay. And then I put in that pour onion mixture for all the chicken. And then Jane will finish up with the recipe on what she made. And then you put this on top of what she made. And then, um, and then you take a chopped up rosemary. You know, you just pull those sprigs off of the stem and chop them up a little bit. You can garnish it and spread it all over evenly. You know, don't do it in big amounts. Just loosely flake it around. And then it's really, and if you want, you can cut lemons very thinly and cut a slit in each lemon and then you can twist it and put it on top of the chicken to make it look more appealing just depends on how fancy you want to get wow yes because we do eat with our eyes you're right that would make it look really pretty right. so you, you made a good point that you're going to put this on top of the dish that jane's going to make so that's going to be right. go great together Yes. That's awesome. But let me yes. just clarify, because I think the sound was going in and out. How long do you keep this in the oven? How long do you cook this? About 30 minutes. So it's 30 okay. minutes on the stove or 30 minutes in the oven on 350. Or, okay. on, a, or on, I guess, a uh, uh, medium, a little bit less to a medium heat on top of the stove. Okay. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. Okay. Is there so, anything else you want to add, Rose? Um, I was going to call you Rosemary, but no. Anything else you want to add to tell us about your dish? So I'm going to move it to the, the finished one. Okay, so now, so now here's the uh, finished product. So here's okay, right, okay. right. Like I said, it's a casserole dish. And this is about two pounds of chicken. Chick, well, it's chicken thighs. 
and uh, Craig's going to show you here. Yep. And I have some, uh, like I said, just some uh, rosemary on top of it for a little bit of garnish. Mm, that looks so good. That looks so good. Thank you. It looks delicious. Good. Alan, what do you think? Oh, I, I don't mean to interrupt you there, Annette. Uh, can, can I ask a quick question or make a quick comment here, uh, Annette? And Please, we're going to make we're going to give her tips and just whatever you want to say. Go ahead. Well, yeah, Tracy, it was. It, yeah, I, I can't wait to sort of smell a vision. Come on, Renee. Uh, uh, that sounds really good and it sounds easy. I was so happy to hear you mention in the beginning of how you use all of your senses. And then throughout the cooking thing, you kind of demonstrated how you use your sense of hearing and smell and et cetera. But when you were mentioning all your senses, you also threw in there a timer of which I have about four or five of them. And you right. have one and it's called memory. Now, as soon as you mentioned that you were not in your own kitchen, I'm sure everyone here can relate to that. Because in my right. kitchen, I know exactly where everything is and I'm sure you do too. But in a right. it is tough sometimes. Right. You know, and then, you know, I, you know, some people don't, you know, know about Be My Eyes, where if you have, you know, um, a phone, a smartphone, you can call them and do not ever be afraid to ask anybody what things look like. And if you don't know which onion's a purple onion or a regular onion, onion there's always somebody on the end of that line that's going to be my eyes that will uh, look for you and tell you what you need. They'll read you whatever you need help with and they will help you learn how to cook also. So, you know, there's options out there for you to help in case if you say, well, I don't have anybody to help me. Well, yeah, you do. You just call through my eyes and they will help you out. That's a great tip. Uh, will we be able to get that number a little later? It's a, it's an app that you uh, go onto your uh, phone app and you download it and it's for free. Okay. And, uh, you just tell your phone to go to be my eyes. And then you find the button and it'll say call for help and it'll keep bringing somebody. You can get anybody around the world, anybody in the United States. And it's just amazing how they will help you out. People have used it for when they're flying on a plane, if they're catching a train, if they're in the store, if they want their clothes organized or your covers organized, somebody is always willing and they're all volunteers. So and I can't tell the difference between a green banana and a yellow banana. <laughs> I love it. Tracy, thank you so much. Annette, did you have anything? No, I think we covered everything. We lose sound? With you, Tracy, is I can tell you from a professional background, being in the restaurant business and being a manager, because when you had said, to add, to sprinkle the, the rosemary over, to make it look good, twist the lemon on top of the chicken. Because we, you know, we eat with our eyes. We want it to look good, even though you can't see it. Mm -hmm. And using my eyes is a perfect way to do that, to make sure it looks good at, at the end when it's all said and done. So I love that tip. Um, another thing that you could have done, but doesn't matter at this point, not being in your own kitchen, Shirley, who is usually on her show, um, she talks about mise en place a lot. And I, I know you know what that is. is to have all your ingredients ready, measured out, and right in front of you. So then you just go and grab them as you go ahead of time. So that's just... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Tracy, are you there? I Yes. I, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> That's okay. I was just wondering if you're familiar. I'm sure you're familiar with the with the uh, procedure called mise en place. What? Have you heard of it before? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. It's called. Let me get closer. My little phone is about 20, 10 feet away. It's called mise en place. It's a Thank French you. term meaning that when we get all our ingredients ahead of time measured and put into perhaps like little cups right. or ramekins. Right. And it's a good way to stay organized when we don't know the kitchen. Because Alan's right. I mean, you're right. When you don't know the kitchen, it's so it can be frustrating. But you did fantastic. I wanted to thank you so much for being on our show today. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Yes, thank you very much. And now let's meet Jane Butler.
Jane is also a member of the Diverse Opportunities for Visually Impaired. Welcome, Jane. Uh, Jane, I know you're there somewhere. <laughs> I don't have a monitor to work with today, guys. Uh, do we have Jane yet? For those of you who have watched our show before, you may notice that I'm broadcasting remotely today from outside my kitchen. I hope someone <laughs> asks me why a little later. She, Jane, she's here. here now. She's here now. Wonderful. Thank you, Renee. Jane, tell us a little bit about yourself. Welcome. Well, my name is Jane Butler. I was born in New Jersey, moved to Michigan, and settled in the Sylvania area, which is outside of Toledo for most of my life, and went to school in Bowling Green, and then moved from there. I was sighted and worked at Walt Disney World, which was a wonderful job. I was oh, a theater wow. major, so I had a, had a great time. And uh, when I was 41, I got an ulcer in my left eye. Just I woke up with a scratch, and I went to the cornea specialist, and over the next couple of months, I found out I have something, it's a really long word. It's called cicatricial pemphigoid. It's an autoimmune disease that attacks your mucous membranes. And of course, mine decided my eyes and my mouth would be attacked. So I had many ulcers and had to have many surgeries at the eye center in uh, University of Michigan. I moved home to be with my parents and now I have been off on my own apartment for 11 years, now living on my own fully. Well, congratulations. Thank uh, you. So, so you, you, where, where did you learn all about your cooking? When did all this start? Cooking? Well, my mom yeah. has always been a really good cook. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely just love, I love being creative. I make jewelry and I to me, cooking in the kitchen is just another extension of creativity. I, I noticed that uh, you said in your bio that you like cooking like you have a family of five, even though you're alone. I do the same thing, and then I put it in little packages in the freezer and microwave it or stick it in boiling water, whatever's appropriate. Is that the way you do it, too? Say that again. I say, I noticed in your bio that you said that you like to cook like you're yeah. cooking for five people. Yeah. I, same thing. And then I packaged all the stuff in little freezer bags and freeze it usually. Yes, I do. Or I do. Or put it in boiling water. Yeah, I do that with soups and I do it with a lot of crock pot meals because, you know, they come out enormous and you can oh, wow. make four or five meals out of a crock pot meal. And I, uh, take a braille. I use my Perkins brailler and I braille labels and label everything in my pantry and in my freezer so I know what I'm going for. Uh, labeling is so very important. You still have some vision left, am I right? Not much. Um, I can see colors, lights, and different shadows and stuff, uh, but not enough to um, try to put the camera across from me. Color is definitely helpful, though. It's helpful in identifying things, for sure. Yeah. Oh, so right. If, if, if you can see me, Renee, I have a tea towel over my shoulder. This is my first tip. When I work in the kitchen, I always put a little tea towel or a dish towel around my shoulder because when you are blind, sometimes you get stuff on your fingers as you're working in the kitchen. And instead of grabbing a paper towel and using a whole roll, I just wipe my fingers on it and then it goes in the dirty laundry. And um, I don't do it when I'm cooking in the oven because I don't want it hanging down, but I do use a tea towel or a towel around my shoulder all the time. It's That's very helpful to just wipe it off. And especially with this uh, potatoes I'm making it has a lot of ingredients that are kind of messy. And you're always washing your hands like I am. I don't put it over my shoulder. I put it in the front pocket of my jeans and I tuck it in so I can grab the outside edge and dry my hands real quick. I guess that's a guy thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a guy thing, I guess. Over the shoulder's a girl thing. Well, 
let's see how we make your slow cooker garlic herb mashed potatoes. They sound great. Well, I'll tell you what, my apartment has smelled like garlic for the last few days and it smells like <laughs> garlic in here. There will be no vampires around me tonight, that's for sure. So um, what I have is the crock pot. You can use red skin potatoes, just wash them. You do not have to peel them, but wash them. And if there's a little eye, cut it out. And then you put them into this crock pot, which has the potatoes in it right now. This, these have been cooking for two, almost three hours on high. I cooked mine on low for five to six hours and stopped at five and a half hours on my final dish that I'll show you later. And they came out great. So um, I mashed it Jane, by hand. Quick question, how, how big of a crock pot are you using? I don't see this, well, I don't see the monitor. This crock pot is, it's a, it's, it's a, size one um it's the same size as i have and you know what i don't know but i can tell you i can fit a nice roast in it a little larger than the average one it's, yeah. the, it's the average one it's not the big mega oh. Uh, oh okay okay yeah okay so um and uh one thing i learned through diverse opportunities for the visually impaired was braille i i learned grade one braille it took me from October 2019 through the pandemic to October 2020. And uh, my teacher was Leah, that's Kevin Dwight. And um, we were very serious about it. When I was on in Fridays for two hours of class, the phone was off. I called her Sarge. She was all business. But she taught me this grade one braille and I braille everything now as far as labels. So I have my little cheat sheet with me here to uh, tell you the ingredients. So the first thing that we're gonna add is four tablespoons of butter. And I have some here already and it's slipping around because it's melting. But just so you know, if you take a stick of butter, it's eight tablespoons. If you cut it down the middle, that's four tablespoons. So you can kind of go along with just a regular knife and cut to what you think would be half, would be four, you know, and then two would be in fours. So that's another hint, and I'm gonna stir this in. That's a really good tip. Yeah, it's a good tip. And when I start measuring uh, my dry ingredients, I measure over a bowl, because if you measure over your dish and the salt goes crazy like mine does, you're gonna really... <laughs> So, I like to do it over a tray. Yeah. The next thing I have is a quarter cup of milk, which I already measured out. I just have to take this off very carefully. And pouring that into the potatoes. Pre-measuring is a good way to do stuff. Yeah, well, I have, actually I have braille measuring cups and the spoons, which I'll be using in a little while. And if you don't know braille and you learn the letters A through D, you can read any measuring cup or spoon because the letters A, B, C, D equal one, two, three, four, and that's all you need. So that's another Very one. Good. Very good tip. Okay, so the sour cream, which is a half a cup, is going in with these potatoes. All right, yeah, I got it pretty much all out of here. There we go. I'll mix that around in a second. Now, there's a number of dry ingredients, and here's where I use my measuring spoons a lot over a bowl. So the first one we're doing is the garlic. Now, this recipe calls for one tablespoon of garlic. I'm going to put two tablespoons in because the ones that I made at home did not seem as if they were garlicky enough. So I'm going to try this out here. And this garlic is garlic well, well enough that I put in to myself. So it's fresh minced garlic, or you could use the stuff that comes in the little jar. But um, because we're going to the Toledo Botanical Garden and planting herbs, we thought we would use some fresh herbs to kind of piggyback onto that trip we're taking on May 27. So there's one tablespoonful going in. And the second tablespoonful 
going in. Okay, so there's the garlic. Now I gotta look at my cheat sheet for a second here. Alrighty, so we've done the butter, we've done the milk, we've done the sour cream, we did our garlic. Okay, so next thing we have is one tablespoon of parsley. And my parsley is right here. in this one here. So we you smell it, right? Dry parsley. I'm using a dried parsley. You could use a regular parsley. If you were Tracy, just talk, you would use cilantro. She she is a great Mexican cook, and I love the way she says cilantro. I tease her about it, but it's really cool. So anyway, I'm trying to find my thing here. Okay. So when I measure, I am going to measure over my bowl. And with my thumb, just gently wipe off the top so that it's level. So in goes the parsley. Cap that up. I like to kind of clean up as I go along or at least keep things in a semi-order or I'll never find my mess when I'm done. Plus, so I'm, very again, good too. I'm not familiar with, you know. All right, parsley. Okay, the next thing is one half teaspoon of basil. Now, I use fresh basil, and that is not it. That is a butter bag, and now I have butter all over my hands. So give me a second here. Thank God for my tea towel, right, Alan? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so here I have a sandwich baggie of basil. Basil is very delicate, so I chopped it up fresh this morning. And this is what is going in to the crock pot. Actually, I'll dump the whole bag in because I had pre-measured that. Okay, um, then let me go back to my little cheat sheet here. Alrighty, we did that. We did our basil. Okay, I forgot. I did, okay, I did oregano when I was supposed to do parsley. So now I'm doing parsley instead of oregano. <laughs> My ground fingers weren't working. So this one is another a tablespoon. I mean, excuse me, a teaspoon, but I'm using a half. So I'm gonna use twice this amount. So there goes a half a teaspoon. And then, like I said, this is dried parsley. It would be nice to have a real fresh parsley, I think, along with that fresh basil. basil. Um, but anyway. Okay, and then I believe our last two ingredients here are salt and pepper. Now, this calls for two teaspoons of salt and one teaspoon of pepper. I like to use a sea salt. I brought my coarse sea salt with me. Um, you can use any salt, but I really prefer sea salt. And so that's what I'll be using. And I'm floundering here for what I need. Okay. So I'm pouring this over the bowl because this comes out really fast. Well, once I get it open correctly, it does. Okay. So I have to do four, your spoon. that's a half. One. Another one. And I'm doing it over the bowl because it's missing some of the spoon. And sometimes I like to use contrasting bowls. Like I use a blue cobalt bowl. Since I can still see some colors and contrast, it's kind of nice for you to be able to see if you can still see colors or shadows, certain things in your, your kitchen. I have no color vision at all, only black and white. And I use that same concept with black, white, and two or three shades of gray. Yeah, the contrast is very helpful, isn't it? Yes. Okay, here goes the last half in. So there's two teaspoons of that. Now, I did call Be My Eyes for my pepper, which is kind of funny. Tracy brought up Be My Eyes. I use them probably on a daily basis. But I also have an Echo Show, which is an Alexa device by Amazon that has a camera on it. And 
I do a lot of my labeling for my um, pantry that way. I just take the can up and I say, what am I holding? And she says, wait a minute, makes a little hum and then says, ding, 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 you're holding red kidney beans or whatever. <laughs> and it's a really neat thing um, I got for Christmas, so. That sounds great. That's another yeah. good. Echo Show is awesome because it really helps with visually impaired folks. So I'm putting in a teaspoon of pepper, which is, this is the half teaspoon or so. There we are, those are all the ingredients. Now the fun comes, the mashing. So if you're really wanting to do some exercise, I am using a hand masher, which I used on the other potatoes earlier. Now. Let's see how these go. These are a little bit hard, but I can still mash them down enough to mix them. How, how long do you have to let them cook? Okay, these cooked for two to three hours on high. I kept mine for five and a half hours on low. So two to three hours on high, five to six hours on low. I preferred the low. Um, okay. It smelled really good. These aren't even mashing. Perhaps these aren't as done as they should have been. But anyway, because as is a magic of TV, I have the finished product. <laughs> so Renee can see. Here are, are the potatoes with all the herbs in it and the garlic mm. and parsley on top. They look pretty. Wow. And they Beautiful. But in fact, I can smell the basil because um, I just added that in extra today since I just crushed it off. So, yep, that's Jane, it. That, that sounds really good. I can't wait for smell of vision Now, I'm a little bit curious about your uh, fresh herb garden. Uh, what, 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 what's that all about? And why don't they have parsley? What did you say, Alan? Well, I'm curious, uh, you were talking about your little fresh, uh, your fresh herb garden where you get fresh herbs? Yes. Uh, is that part of the uh, part of the visually impaired program or is that something different? Yeah, it's an activity we're going to do. We're going to something called the Toledo Botanical Gardens on May 27th. And we are learning how to make raised herb beds, garden beds. And we're planting, I believe, rosemary, a lemon basil and something else and I don't remember what the other one was. And what? Oregano. And oregano. And so yeah. you can have them on your windowsill or out on your patio. And then on June 1st, to piggyback with that, they have a accessibility garden that's brand new and we're one of the first groups that's gonna get to go through that. And it's touch, smell, um, there's a water wall and there's lots of different, different things. So I'm really looking forward to that. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. Uh, also know that notice that you mentioned that you clean as you go. What another great tip. Uh, it's so easy. And then you just dry your hands off on that towel, whether yeah. it's your shoulder or in your pocket. That butter was pretty slippery and I got some sour cream and stuff on my hands, but all I had to do was wipe it off. And, and my hands, I can kind of now, if I had to put something in the oven, I wouldn't have to run to the sink. You know, I, my hands feel clean. Yes, yes. And if you need to and it's a little hot, you can use that towel to pick something up with, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Annette, what do you think? Do you have, did you have any questions or comments? I don't think. <laughs> no, I just... You feel. don't think? We don't pay you enough to think? Is <laughs> I'm, just, I'm feeling. I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling Jane because I'm so excited, you know, because of the herb garden. That's a fantastic idea because if you're going to grow anything, the best thing to start out with with herbs. They're kind right. of easy to, easy to grow, right? And, and they're free. That's what's so exciting about it. And it gives you a good feeling, right? To grow your own herbs and to be able to use oh, yeah. them in your food. Well, I'm a program director at Diverse Opportunities for the Visually Impaired. So I work a lot with the volunteers coordinating them, but I also look for new programs that are out there. Um, when we needed Bibles, I got donations. When we needed a couple restaurant donations, I got those for different groups, activities we were doing. So I like to get out there and, 
and stump it and try to, to get stuff going for the group. That's awesome. You are doing just great. Thank you Thank so you. much. And Thank those you so potatoes, much. can't wait to try them. I'm sure we'll have our recipes at the uh, Cooking Without Looking. I'll give you the information a little later. I'd like to add something if I could. Yeah. Sure. Okay, Alan, I know you're in the Braille Club. And Jane, you said you were using Braille. From what I understand from other people that have been on a cooking show, the cooking show has been going on for many, many years. We've had some awesome guests. The climate that I'm getting or the vibe that I'm getting from the guests is that Braille is a lost art. And not everybody is learning Braille because of all of the electronic devices. And I just think it's impressive that you know Braille. And I wanted to just curious where you learned it and why. You learned it. Well, I'll tell you, Renee, when I first started going blind, my mom kept saying, you should learn Braille, you should learn Braille. And a lot of my blind friends said, oh, you can't do it because your hands aren't sensitive when you're older and it's hard. But um, I know different languages, and that is one of my skills is learning languages. And in a way, Braille is its own language because of the memorization and a lot of putting together things that part of your brain works. So I, I wanted to learn enough Braille to play Uno with a group of friends that were blind and visually impaired. So I told Leah I wanted to learn Braille just to play Uno. But before I knew it, I fell in love and... Um, I got the Perkins Brailler as a donation that was left over from someone at the site center. And so now I have my own Perkins Brailler. Instead of using the slate and stylus, I can do my own brailing on my own machine. And I write letters to people. And like I said, I label things. And um, it's definitely amazing gift to have. And when you need to get a new debit card, you can braille it out and read it to somebody instead of having someone try to read it to you a million times and memorize it. It's, there are so many different ways you can use braille in the sight and care world, and I would recommend it highly. It sounds like you're passionate about not, it. It, it, it is but, certainly most not a dead language. It's not only a, 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 a second language, it's almost like you can use it like a little code. But exactly. it's another tool to put in your toolbox to help you label things to maintain your independence. Yes. I mean, you know, soup cans and, and uh, chicken gravy and things like that all feel the same. So if I go to the Echo Show and I say, what am I holding? And it says, you're holding mushroom soup or celery soup for making, you know, tuna noodle casserole. I label that put it in order. And then when I go to make my tuna noodle casserole, I'm not fumbling around with 12 cans trying to guess. So it's a time saver as well. And it's just, it's a lovely thing to learn. Excellent. Please keep that passion going. I, I'd like to learn it myself, actually. I'm not totally blind, but I think it's a cool thing to know. Thank you so much. And Helen, you want to sum it up? Oh, man, I think that was just absolutely wonderful, Jane. You did it. Those potatoes sound great. I can't wait for smell of vision I keep saying that. <laughs> Annette, what's up next? Hey, well, we're saving the best for last. Not really. Y'all been wonderful. So wonderful. But last but not least is the executive director of the Diverse Opportunities for the Visually Impaired. That's Pastor Kevin. Pastor, are you there, sir? Pastor Perrine, hello there. How are you? Good afternoon. Good, good to hear from you. I wish I could see you, but my camera is about, I don't know, 10 15 feet away and I can't see. Oh, well, you're but not. Anything. I can still listen if you'll just speak up a little bit. I have some uh, information I want to get from you. I want it all. I want it all. Uh, so I want to hear about your story. I want to know about your eye condition, about the services that you offer, some of the misconceptions. Let's start out with, I listened to your podcast and your eye condition, you said, folks, it's, it's a foggy day every day. Tell us about your eye condition and then we'll go into some other things about your organization. Please. Well, my eye condition is just most people who have eye problems have maybe one or two. 
my condition is so rare that I have five different conditions and two of them um, are not even listed in medical. You have to go to rare um, disease and the national um, level of my bottom. You faded out there. Can you, can you keep going? Tell us about when your condition happened. What exactly did you see? You were breaking. Renee, do you know what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Can't hear him. No. Um, Pastor? Pastor yes. Green? Okay, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, okay, so there's a lot of fur reverb. My eye, condition, my eye condition is such that instead of having one or two, like most average people who are visually impaired, I have five different things wrong with my eyes. Oh. It's a genetic condition that all the males in my family back about six generations have it. Oh, my. So it's genetic. Yes. And when did you become blind and, and what is your vision now, if any? Uh, I was born with it. Actually, um, my first eye doctor was, um, I saw the first eye doctor when I was uh, three weeks old and have been seeing him since then. Um, so that's when I, I, start, I came out blind. My father's uh, visually impaired, my grandfather and so on and so on. But you do have some vision in one eye. It's like 2300, isn't it? Yes. In one eye, I have enough vision that I can perceive large items like refrigerator, beans, carbs, things like that. Okay, I'm glad you can see cars. That's very important. When you go out, yeah. you go out in public. <laughs> Do you use a cane or a guide dog or you just uh, use the vision you have? Uh, no, I use either a guide dog or a cane. Okay, okay. Okay, because, well, so, uh -huh, go because, ahead. I was gonna say because of the population in Toledo, if you don't use a cane or a dog when you travel on the streets of Toledo, Spain, you're taking your life in your own hands. Uh, I can relate to that. South Florida, <laughs> it's like, cannot walk. Nobody walks around and they have right. no regard for pedestrians. Well, as I was telling Renee uh, a couple of days ago that like on the podcast, there's a lot of people in Toledo that don't recognize their cane because of it being for visually impaired people. They recognize it as for your grandparents who used to use it for support. But so we're, we're some of the stuff that we do is education to educate the public that those canes that we utilize are not just to support us in that way to, because of our other issues. There's a lot of misconceptions. I want you to tell me more about those, but first tell me why you started this organization and what are some of the services, the most popular ones that you, that you have, please. Okay, we, we started it in Toledo um, just for the simple reason is there was a lot of people, the population in Toledo didn't have a lot of recreational activities. So that's why we started it. And some of the activities we started with were some of the um, common things like bowling. Um, and then we got connected with the United States Association with Blind Athletes and started doing some of their activities. Um, and a lot of the stories that we heard from people, such as um, the, both of the women that we're cooking today are part of a support group that our organization sponsored once a month. Um, and that group helps them people connect, uh, the women of the group connect with each other to support them through different um, things such as Tracy mentioned. Um, and that was one of the biggest requests that we had was support in that way. The other issues that we had was like Jane said, was there was a lot of people, not only people who were visually impaired who recently went blind, but parents who had children who were blind, but they were not, who wanted to learn Braille. So that was another big um, question in Toledo, Lucas County. So these are common things that come up that people don't think about 
and that they need help with. I'm sure there's many, many more such as, tell us about the aging population, how you help them, number one. And number two, tell us about the couch potatoes. And expound on that, you said a little bit with exercise, but go back to tell us why the aging population needs your services. Well, a lot of the people who uh, participate in the group, we have people that run from the age of about 26 on up to one of our oldest people that participate is in their 80s. So we carry um, activities for all of those people. Um, and we, we even have some people who will be doing things during the summer um, who are younger than that in high school. Uh, so we found that the highest population rate in Toledo who are visually impaired are those who are 55 plus and even higher than that. And a lot of that is because of macular degeneration and other conditions. But the people who have been um, born with it or who have had it long-term vision problem, a lot of those people um, are what, what I might phrase a couch potato who their family or friends do everything for them, where we're not about that. We want that person to get out and eat healthy. Um, just like for an example, um, when we had a fundraiser, Tracy was the head cook during that activity, but she cooked healthy food. So it's about getting those people off the couch, getting them healthier, because sometimes with some of the conditions that we deal with, food is related to that condition, sugar that you might take too much of it or too little of it in your food intake. So we deal with some of those kinds of issues also. Well, that's wonderful because, you know, we've been doing this show, Cooking Without Looking for many years. And the people have even come on Renee's podcast that you could watch on your favorite podcast stations. The people have been so accomplished. I mean, you have people that are singing and mountain climbing and riding bikes and doing all sorts of things. And they're blind, it's amazing. But then there's right. another population, right, that gets depressed because they feel like they can't do anything because they're visually impaired or blind. So they do stay on the couch. So your organization is offering them opportunities of equality so they don't have to feel depressed or isolated, correct? Correct, correct. Just as um, Jane has mentioned, uh, with the botanical gardens, a lot of the people who are participating in that um, we chose to do gardens that were raised gardens because that way, because of their age, they didn't have to kneel down in the dirt and have to worry about getting back up with assistance. These are gardens that are on tables and um, wherever you can put them, like in a windowsill for some people who live in apartments. So we take that into consideration. We have a woman who um, was in her 70s who were bowling with us and we have things to help those people. Our volunteers are priceless here in Toledo. Um, the people who have helped today, um, Tracy May's uh, parents, um, Craig, who's behind the camera, and other people, the people who donated this facility for us for today. Um, so we have a lot of support from other organizations and other people in the local area. Yeah, Pastor Perrine, I, I just hope for you that this organization can go national because unlike an organization that might just help you get a job, they're strictly like, what equipment do we supply for you? This organization is one of the heart, I feel, that it covers a broad spectrum of services, anything from you know, how to vacuum if you're blind and you can't see, to you know, how to do things in the kitchen. So I want you to sum up for us too, all the services that you offer, again, so people know, and also, how can they contact you if they're interested in learning more about your organization? Well, as I told Renee on the podcast, um, we base a lot of our programs on if people call us or email us and say, we have this need or this want. Um, one of the programs that we're going to be doing in July is a tandem bicycling training. And that came about because one of the people called me and said, hey, I have this tandem bike. I want to learn how to do it. Um, let's get something together. Volunteers go out to one of the local parks and do it. So um, a lot of the programs, 
We do everything, as Jane said, from teaching individuals Braille to like um, Tracy said, from um, doing social interactions at support groups. We have other groups that do. Um, Jane's also involved with another group who um, does a Bible study. Um, and the, from those groups, a lot of um, cell groups have broken out and those people in those groups have been supportive to each other in times of trials, medical and otherwise. So how and many so, volunteers do you have? Uh, right now, presently, we have in the neighborhood of about 19 who work um, with us in some way or participate in the activities. Okay, so just so I'm clear, if somebody is watching today or listening today, and they don't live in the Ohio area, can they still contact you and perhaps you could give them some guidance or encouragement or direction as to what to do and, and please give us your email or contact information again and again. Okay, yes, we have people who we have helped in other states from New York to Rhode Island to Kentucky. Um, we had um, someone from Illinois, uh, we do have a couple people who come from Monroe, Michigan that participates. Um, those people we've helped from doing, the one woman we've helped with resources, finding um, electronics for her because she was on social security. We, we went to um, helping her learn braille. Um, so all they have to do is call us or email us our phone number is 419-699-1864, or our email is infobobi at mail.com. Okay. Okay. I'm sure they'll put that in the uh, show notes, or you can watch this again, because it is going to be taped. You can listen to that again if you didn't catch that email. But that's fantastic. I'm so excited. I'm definitely going to contact you because I've shied away from doing some things, having a, a form of macular degeneration. And I, I just didn't know where to turn. You know, Division of Blind Services is great, but that's more for finding a particular work or job. But for right. anything else, I didn't really know who to call. And I'm sure there's people listening today that just need a little bit more direction. Well, and, and, I, and not know, only that, one of the other things that we do is the individuals that came to us um, needed to learn a cell phone, but she went to um, a state organization. They gave her five hours of training, which from even my knowledge of cell phones, it took me a lot longer than five hours to learn <laughs> a cell phone. So we came in after them and helped her learn more, brushed up things, taught her more things, and even took her a step farther and helped her with her iPad. So, um, and you're right, as you said, there's a lot of state and local national programs that will help you to a certain point, business-wise to get you a job. But a lot of times after that, it's like you fell through the cracks. And so that's where we come in. We come after that and say, we can help you with these things. Yes, Pastor, you have the right title because you have a lot of heart, I can tell. I could definitely tell, but I need to know how to vacuum if I can't see, but oh no, I do have a robot vacuum cleaner, <laughs> but somebody out there that doesn't have a robot, how do you vacuum if you can't see? Tell us. Okay, well, the way my wife is totally blind, actually, she just had surgery to get prosthesis, and the way she, she vacuums, and it's an upright vacuum that she uses, is she does it in a pattern. She starts in one corner, and then works around the room. And she knows where all the furniture is because echo of hearing where the furniture is. So she just moves around the room in a pattern from one corner to another until she's done. She also, um, we have a shop vac that we use in, um, out on our front porch and out on our deck. And with that, she sits down and just does the same kind of pattern. She sits down in one corner and works all the way to the other side. Wow, let me tell you, you got her trained. You got her trained. I would say M-A-I-D, honey. Get me a maid. <laughs> uh, people people <laughs> took her the other way, so. <laughs> Just kidding. 
Well, that's fantastic. I could listen to you all day. You're amazing. Your organization, Diverse Opportunities for the Visually Impaired is amazing. Your volunteers, Tracy and Jane, thank you so much for being here. Alan, do you want to add to closing up for today? Thank you so much. No. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Pastor, thank you so very much. And just a couple of quick misconceptions. Is it true that sea salt will help your eyesight? No. <laughs> There's a lot of things Is it possible to catch blindness by casual eye contact? Uh, I can tell you carrots don't, so. Carrots don't do it either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Pastor. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Our Alan? next show. Alan? Yeah. Yeah. Before before we end, because you're so good at it, I, I see my cousin here from Belgium. He's on. Uh, oh. Terry, he's, he is a chef, Absolutely. and he's Point also is. visually impaired. Thierry, is that how you say your name? Yes. Hello, Point. hello. I know, hello. I know it's very late over there, but I, I saw you here, so I just, before that's, we that's cut That's so off, late over here. What time is it? Uh, 10 o'clock. Oh wow! Well, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. And, and I, 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 I didn't, I didn't want to be remiss in not saying anything about you because I saw you come on. And thank yeah, you yeah. for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, Thierry's a chef, and he's also visually impaired. So, Alan, take it away. Well, thank you, and perhaps he's a, a person who'd like to be on a future show. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Our next show is going to be on Friday, June 11th at about 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. If you want to reach out to us and want to see the recipe from today's show, please go to www.cookingwithoutlookingtv.wordpress.com. Also, you can listen to our Cooking Without Looking podcast anywhere you get your favorite podcasts. And if you would like to help sponsor our show or our podcast, please call 305-200-9104. Now, it's because of all of you audience, it's because of our audience that we all love doing this show. So thank you. Thank you very much for watching today. And uh, if... Um, uh, and thank you for helping us. Uh, let's see, changing the way we see blindness. Uh, and see you again on June 11th. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.